All right, so I'd like to, to explore today the concept of mindfulness and heroism. I just need to... Yes. There we go. So, um, psychology typically has placed a lot of emphasis on pathology. But in recent years, positive psychology, now well-being research, quality of life areas, <coughs> have now began to look a little further at human potential. So in this paper, I'd like to build a bridge between mindfulness and heroism and ask the question, can mindfulness play a role in training people and potentially its ultimate goal, certainly in the traditional mode, is enlightenment? And if so, could it build superheroes? So we're going to explore the methods, practices and findings of mindfulness and we're going to see if this old approach can train the modern hero. So, Franco and Zimbardo, as we've uh, uh, heard today, they propose these four dimensions. So it's got to involve some kind of risk or uh, a quest. It can be passive, as we've said, the, the unsung hero, um, or it can be active, or it can also be a one-off event, or it can be a very slow event over many years that really doesn't necessarily look particularly heroic. But how do we locate the causes and conditions? This is really quite a, a complex question. For example, is it ordinary people with ordinary personalities that are activated when situational pressures uh, are exerted upon them to do these extraordinary things? Or is it not that? Is it highly moral, integrated, psychologically sort of aware and, and balanced individuals that from that place uh, they demonstrate heroic behaviour? Or is heroism in some ways an interaction between virtuous people in challenging situations? So one of the difficulties that we've got is this diversity. Because heroes are really quite diverse also in their, their different levels of, of, of virtue. The question I've got is, is there a continuum of heroism in which we can progress? And if so, is it possible to have a perfect hero, a superhero? So the developmental theory, as we've actually heard today, I mean, typically it actually maps more in a, uh, in, in a linear direction. Of course, what we've looked at today was lovely to, to, to hear it's, um, that it's much more complex um, than that. But typically it is measured in, in progress along different dimensions, cognition, affect, behaviour and so on. So, how do we look at potentially the development of heroes? So some of the relevant stage theories from our past basically could have been uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, Kohlberg's stages of moral development, Fisher's cognitive development and so on. And perhaps more current research is going to take this to a, to a whole new level. I certainly think it's an area that is um, begging for some, for some great research. Perhaps also a relevant area is um, Fowler's psycho-spiritual stages, or William James's study of the mystical or enlightenment uh, experiences. Because what these look at, in terms of heroes, is the most advanced or the highest level, you could say, of, of human development, and what they might consider sometimes as the completion or transcendence of even the developmental stages. Perhaps it's in these areas that we could find people who demonstrate the liberated self-sacrificing features of the heroic figure. Now studies of these experiences uh, basically divide them into two types, whether they are transient or whether they're persistent. And, and Maslow actually in his completion of the self-actualization process in his hierarchy of needs found that this, this last point um, basically, he described as you know, peak experiences. It's basically, what they would say is an awakening, or which would be like a temporary moment that we all might have at certain points in our life where everything potentially just falls away or changes. Or they might also describe it as an ongoing state, which would be the enlightenment traditions or, or sainthood even. So these for the more long-term or persistent versions. But it appears that these experiences could be accessible uh, across a whole range of developmental levels rather than just only at the end. In fact, there's some interesting uh, research on, on the use of um, 
mushrooms and, and not only just uh, the, the mystical traditions, but there, now, nowadays there is a, there's a whole almost informal inquiry and exploration in, into these peak states. Um, and you know, with its, also with its consequences, in fact, uh, Jeffrey Martin wrote some interesting research and he aptly named it, ego development stage does not, pres does not predict persistent non-symbolic experience. Or those experiences we can have, but we can have them within a context of, of, of uh, maturity or immaturity. They don't, don't necessarily uh, have to be almost like a prerequisite. What this indicates, like the findings of heroism, is that these extraordinary states can occur in otherwise ordinary people. So here we find it in yet another field. So what this paper asks is if individuals were trained to integrate and complete each developmental level, would they be able to consistently think and behave heroically? Could we have a predictable trait hero rather than the unpredictable state hero? So let's have a look at one of the methodologies that might give us uh, some information about this. So we're going to explore mindfulness and its role in this inquiry. Because uh, it's under increasing scientific scrutiny now, it's actually giving us a lot of data in terms of uh, the efficacy of its, of its practices. So we're going to look at the theories, practices and evidence and see what its potential is in this field. First, though, there are two models these days. There's the traditional and there's the modern one. So in, in recent uh, years, the, the clinically-based 35-year-old model of, of Kabat-Zinn through his uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum is one version. And then we've got the other, which is the 2,500-year-old one, which is based in Buddhism. Now, both versions aim to develop a sort of a meta-awareness, you could say, or, or self-regulation, self-awareness where you can effectively uh, modulate your behaviour. And they also cultivate a positive relationship between self and the rest of the world, you could say. And the goal of all of that is to transcend self-focused needs and have uh, more pro-social action. So mindfulness practitioners aim to observe their thinking patterns with non-reactive neutrality which means that they're able to step back potentially in a crisis situation and observe what, what are my choices here, rather than perhaps being so uh, driven by the, you know, the autonomic nervous system, the fight-flight response. Now, these methods don't suggest changing the thought, but more observing what might be going, which I need to run from here, as opposed to I need to I've step back and I can observe is that the best choice for the well-being of, of the whole. So, uh, with modern mindfulness, because there isn't really an authoritative version um, as such, um, there is quite a, a variety in the descriptions. In fact, we've got at least eight different self-report scales now that don't always correlate with each other. So there's some uh, methodological issues that have occurred in, uh, from a, because it's been extracted from, you could say, the, the Enlightenment tradition. Traditional mindfulness uh, is a little bit more specific. Uh, it's in the service, you could say, of this self-actualization, this liberation, or this enlightenment. And the foundation of that is interesting. It's the non-existence of an abiding <coughs> self. So rather what is there is an egoless state that is spontaneously drawn to the service of all sentient beings, is, is their position. Now, in view of the possible relevance to heroism science, we're going to look at the theories and practices of these and see, could they be built to systematically create a trait-like hero? So the higher order goal that underpins all theory and practice of traditional mindfulness, now simply we're going to refer to it as mindfulness, is to attain egoless enlightenment for the benefit of all. This is the intention that drives all the practices and behaviours and it uses a range of intentional methods uh, to do so. So we're going to have a little look at uh, what some of these particular methods are. So one of them is the sense of self, or in this case, the, the lack of sense of self. It's typically experienced by people normally as a non... Um, the construct of me is the one that de defines what I do. In Buddhism and mindfulness, this is not the case. 
they would call this um, a, const a construct, a mental construct. The underlying principle of mindfulness is that all phenomena are actually devoid or empty of inherent existence. This includes both uh, an, um, inanimate objects, but also the, the, the animation that we'd say that goes on in our head. They would say, even this, the concept of a sense of self, or me, is constructed and, and essentially empty. So the practitioner's goal is to become aware of the present moment. But more than that, just in terms of modern mindfulness, it's actually to see the essential emptiness of that moment, uh, including this one. So the role of the practice is to train the mind to see that there are no autonomous entities such as I, the mind, the subject, or it, the world, the object, but rather a combination of mental processes that give rise to a certain set of causes and conditions. So once this is seen, they would say that there is a natural, selfless way of experiencing, because literally there is no construct of self separating you and the other, and so a more natural sense of relating to the world without any barrier or lock between uh, occurs. As there is no me to project, just an uh, easy, what they call open awareness, it feels no separation from this, altruism potentially is automatic. The training essentially um, is split into three, study, contemplation and meditation. So briefly, uh, study explores <coughs> the cognitive processes, <coughs> what occurs, um, and basically how you, can you dismantle the, uh, the cognitive process to reveal uh, the optionality of this I, this, this ego. So it ultimately creates the opportunity to explore the no ego awareness processing state. And it does this systematically. It then looks at all the negative emotions that can occur as a result of having this sense of self and others. Second part of the training is contemplation, where they apply uh, all of these things um, to your life. And they look at specific ways to actually reduce uh, all the ways that you might feel uh, some sense of um, basically aversion to people or a need to hold on to something with someone or a disinterest. So wherever there is a gap. When, when we're looking at the next stage, which is contemplation, essentially you'd look at your present, your past and your future and see how can I be more skillful. And the idea is to be able to uh, look at improving almost one's codes of contact and creating these four down the bottom, what we'd call equanimity, empathetic joy, uh, and overcoming ego grasping. And finally, meditation is one of the specifics where they say we would try to get a direct uh, experience of this no self place, or a direct access to the enlightenment experience, or pure awareness without a sense of self. Over time, this basically reduces and ultimately eliminates unnecessary mind wandering. And the efficiency of the attentional system uh, improves. Vigilance becomes uh, greater and a more choiceless awareness occurs. So the meditation practices that they would look at, there's two types. There's basically single-pointed concentration on a particular object, or there is more open, uh, you could say present moment, as present moment awareness uh, concentration. So with both of these, uh, over time, there is a greater ability to attend to the moment. If you can achieve this, mindfulness training basically says that there are a few levels of, of attainment on us. Level one is where you can observe your thoughts, feelings, sensations objectively and neutrally. Le mindfulness. Level two is where you get a sense of calm abiding, where you can experience all these things without seeing the necessity of a, of a self uh, in the experience of that. And finally, the third stage is where that sense of self is actually dropped away, and now there's a sense of this oneness in the whole uh, experience of what's in front of you. So th those three uh, results, you could say, is what mindfulness would, would offer to, uh, you could say, heroism. And, the, and, the, and the, the relevance of this, I guess, would be that in this third stage, if it actually says that this is what are the results of mindfulness training, then what is dissolving 
is potentially the sense of self-protection uh, that comes when I'm in front of a confronting object or some kind of threat. They would say that that is dissolved and what's now present is a spontaneous altruism which looks at what is best for the whole. So these would, mindfulness in its, in its own field would say these are the results we expect. But let's look at what uh, neuroscience uh, basically has said. Now, just briefly, the default uh, mode network is, is uh, one of the, the things that they've found um, is responsible for mind wandering. And uh, it increases in activity when people make really self-relevant or emotionally relevant uh, decisions. And it's, and it's correlated with um, ADD, attentional lapses, anxiety, depression, and also reductions in sensory or um, perceptual processing. Now, when we look at what actually has occurred when people are trained in mindfulness, um, one of them is that they actually get a relatively less DMN activation. And they get significant reductions in mind wandering and reactivity to distractions. And this is, in a sense, what the results are now finding. It's also been found to improve attentional regulation, assist in better executive monitoring, improved orientating ability, and improved alerting related processes. So basically, meditators have been found to actually become better at being able to have uh, conflict monitor, as in like a greater perceptual awareness as to what's needed at the time, uh, increased working memory, cognitive control, and other centeredness or altruism. Also during meditation, or as a result of it, there's an enhancement of primary sensory awareness. So there's ability to actually perceive in a more active context what's actually going on, because the uh, you can say the cognitive processes are not being brought into just focusing on me, they're actually more uh, available to um, in an auditory and visual capacity. So what these findings are suggesting is that mindfulness training is associated with both dimensions of the DMN, namely a reduction in redundant cognitive processing that's going to get in the way of a heroically appropriate you could say, response. Um, and also an increase in perceptual processing in terms of being able to attend to the relevant stimuli that I need to look at in terms of how to make a choice. <coughs> Finally, uh, in terms of neuroimaging, um, they've actually found that the neural structures underlying um, the sensory and perceptual processes are larger in meditators. They actually, through a bit like, you know, through habituation and um, continual stimulus through the neural networks, increase. So they've actually found these structures um, are larger but where um, the structures that are connected to unnecessary rumination are smaller. So it's almost like the brain is being trained up to be more adaptive and appropriate according to the context that it's in front of. So what's also interesting is that mindfulness practitioners in the more advanced levels <coughs> have demonstrated reduced activity in emotional areas uh, during acute pain. They've got lower pain sensitivity and higher thresholds of pain. It's the ability to, to watch and observe neutrally and non-judgmentally the sensations that are moving through the body. They can also demonstrate a reduction in the fear response with a more rapid decreases in skin conductance following aversive stimuli and also decreased startle amplitude. So the actual ability to just step back and observe doesn't, um, doesn't mean that the actual system is now in the automatic sort of instinctual mode. So... Um, Let's just um, strip this down a bit further. The question that we started to, to look at was the attributes of a hero. And can they be built? Well, <laughs> or if so, is there any evidence to suggest that this is the case? We have found that across the board, uh, attention in all areas has increased, while, while sensory, not just in cognitive, but also in terms of sensory processing as well. So the, the goal basically to, to look at as I close is, is it possible to have heroically relevant qualities that can be improved by mindfulness training? The traditional model is to look at, can I remove this sense of self or this construct of self so that you have a natural egoless place? If this is the case, is it possible that over time these development issues can be um, reduced? And is it possible 
that if mindfulness actually gets someone to the place where they can observe neutrally and non-judgmentally the stimulus in front of them without having a sense of self to protect, could, and they are able to do that consistently, are we able to move from not just these uh, problematic state-like um, presentations of heroic behaviour, but move to a more trait-like process or trait-like um, exhibition of, of heroic behaviour. So the question, if that is possible and an enlightened hero could be created, then maybe there is a superhero in all of us. <laughs> Any questions? Patrick? Yes. Patrick, are there efforts to bring mindfulness practices into the school curriculum to teach children at a young age how to engage in, in, in these processes and, and become develop a heroic mindset? It's, it's certainly in, I know here in Perth, um, there are some very strong movements that are actually now are going national in terms of bringing mindfulness specifically to schools. I like the fact that um, this heroism area is so aligned, I think, that, and I just think it would be a, just a lovely, almost sell point as to how to be able to construct that in a way that is really applicable to, to kids. I remember when I, my child was in grade four, um, I went to give them a little meditation about mindfulness uh, years ago, and um, I, I dressed up in Batman or whatever it was, and they were just so much more ready to listen to this <laughs> person doing meditation. So yeah, there's potential, I think, to do this. Just, um, in the previous talk when we talked about PTSD, how would that, would that have an impact on, on, on post-traumatic stress and how would that relate if mindfulness has been practiced before, yeah. especially like within... Yeah, I get it, yeah. yeah. I, I think this does link a lot to that research. Um, I think the difference between resilience training and, and mindfulness I mean, the, the typical adaptation reflex point is, is 8 to 12 weeks where you can adapt to almost every event. Except if you can't, um, you know, I'm not sure if you know, you might come and set point well-being, which is on average across the world is around 7 out of 10 or 70. If you have a problematic event that takes you um, below your, your baseline, usually it's 8 to 12 weeks of cognitive processes, social networks, you know, pulling everything together to bring myself back up, up to that set point that I typically am at based upon all the, the in, enduring cognitive and behavioural structures that keep me at that set point. But if I can't do that, then the set point goes down to wherever it is, say now 60, and it, and it stays there. Or if, the, if you're now in the PTSD profile, as very eloquently described today, you know, you're down to perhaps 40, then that now be, can become your new set point. The adaptation reflex isn't strong enough to bring you back up. So resilience training is one way to be able to assist people to do that. And mindfulness, in a sense, is connected to that because it's about the ability to, to stand back and observe and attend to the three things in the human machine, thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations that are occurring when I'm having a traumatic event. And it's this ability to step back and observe that rather than be driven by that that enables the person to start being able to let that event wash through and get processed. Yes, thank you. Oh. Stop us when